for their very warm welcome tonight. They've been hugely, hugely enthusiastic about this event, as am I, uh, as I'm sure will all of you be. Um, my friend and, and as well colleague, uh, Dino, will introduce the speakers tonight, as well as Rupert and Sophie, our hosts. But let me first introduce Dino, who is not merely a beef expert, uh, a director of O'Shea's Butchers, but a man of many parts, and in fact a food writer too. Um, he, he has immense knowledge on very many topics. Um, and before I embarrass him too much, as he's looking distinctly embarrassed, I'll hand over without any further ado, and Dino will take us through the course of the evening. And um, well, Dino, over to you. I will help in any way I can. Thank you, uh, Oprah. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I'd just like to say a few words about um, Rupert Power and Sophie Bathgate, who are the founders of Sophie's. Um, those of you who are old enough, like me, to remember 10 or 12 years ago, uh, certainly in London, there were two places you could go to eat a good steak. Um, somewhere like uh, the Rib Room at the Carlton's House, as it was known in those days, or Dorchester Grill, or one of these uh, fine hotels, or the Aberdeen Steakhouse. <laughs> so, so, so if anyone's been to the Aberdeen Steakhouse, I probably don't need to say anymore. <laughs> so, so there wasn't really, you know, um, an original steakhouse. And, and the interesting thing about Sophie and uh, Rupert is at the age of three, I think it was, when they were together in uh, primary school, they first had the idea of creating a sort of Anglo-Saxon steakhouse. And um, you know, many years later, or a few years later, I should say, uh, Sophie's uh, opened in, um, to great fanfare in the Fulham Road in, in London. And it's really, I mean, they're, they're very modest people, and they, 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 they really deserve a lot of credit to, to take steak to a different level uh, in the UK and bring good steaks people um, in London and uh, I know they get, they get people coming from all over the UK and, and further to, to, to Italy. So I'd, I'd like to just again thank them for allowing us to host this event in this wonderful place right in the centre of London. I'd just like to say a few things about steak. Um, we've got some great wines which uh, uh, Tom Gilby is going to talk about um, as well, but something to think about when you're eating a steak. A great wine, we've got a very good Bordeaux tonight, which is Chateau Cissac. On average has 386 flavor components. A good steak has 340, so it gives you an idea. If you're eating a good steak, you probably have 340 different components of flavor. Sorry. Okay. The other thing I'd like to say is that, like most things, what is a good steak is very much a personal and subjective thing. There's also a cultural phenomenon that there are people here from different parts of the world. They've grown up eating a certain type of steak, a certain type of breed of meat, and in, in different ways. So we've got a, 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 an Italian gentleman here. When he, when he grew up, he probably had meat that was fairly fresh. That's the cultural norm in Italy, even though I know many Italians who like aged meat. But generally speaking, the recipes and the way they eat meat is, is fairly fresh. It's very similar in Argentina, where meat tends not to be aged, even though I know Argentinians who age meat in the Anglo-Saxon way to a certain extent. So I think it's important to note that it's a subjective thing. There are people who grew up in North America, they've had mainly corn-fed beef, they get used to the taste, that's what they like, that's what they know, that's what they love. It's a very subjective and personal thing, so something, something to talk about. But with my uh, O'Shea's uh, hat on, um, you know, obviously we spend a huge amount of time sourcing um, what we think is the best beef in the world. And this is something that um, the O'Shea's family have been doing since 1789, written in Tipperary, and they're so obsessive about it that they effectively had to move out of Ireland 
uh, because tastes changed so much there that they, they really followed the market and went to where their meat, which tends to be a particular type of uh, beef, selected, uh, aged and butchered, uh, is welcome. So they ended up in Brussels and in London. Um, a few words about the important topics, I think, to consider when selecting and talking about what is it good beef and good steak. Um, husbandry is very important. I think that's a, that's a no-brainer. Uh, and something I'm, I'm very keen to, to talk about and get feedback on is, I like to use the French word terroir, which is mainly associated with wine, but what, what the animals are eating, the environment they're in, the soil, the grass, if that's the case, or the grain, very important factors in, um, in producing beef. Uh, aging is another factor, which I briefly touched upon, and, and also the breed. There are certain breeds that are probably better for beef, beef production than others, and we're going to have quite a few of them tonight. Um, and finally, there's the butcher. Um, the butcher plays an important role. A good butcher brings added value, and the added value is the selection, the relationship with the farm, the aging and obviously the butchering of the meat. So in many ways a butcher should be like an affineur is for cheese. It has to be added value. If you just go and select meat from a wholesale market, move it from A to B, are you doing something superior to what a supermarket is doing these days? Probably not. But I'll leave it to you to decide. I'm briefly going to go through the different types of beef we're going to have tonight. So. We're going to have some Black Angus from Perthshire in Scotland, which comes from nine farms uh, selected by O'Shea's. Uh, all the meat is going to be cooked medium rare. Uh, and the, in most cases, it's going to be a cook de boeuf, a ribeye on the bone, which will be sliced up and served for you to taste. Um, we also have um, an English rare breed called Sussex, which is actually not from Sussex today, but is actually from Southwest Island in Munster. Again, has fantastic pastures, very similar to those in, in uh, very sweet grass, terrible weather, rains a lot, the soil is very good, so that'd be an interesting comparison. From the US, we have Greater Omaha, Nebraska, USDA Prime. This is a corn-fed centric animal, not grass-fed. We've got from New South Wales in Australia, uh, what we think is one of the best Wagyu's produced outside of Japan, and in fact exported to Japan from uh, this particular farm. And uh, finally we have some purebred Black Angus from South Oxford, from Rufford Farm, and we're very lucky to have uh, Jeremy Moxford, who owns the farm, who just happened to pop in today and is um, Sophie's father who inspired the uh, uh, not just the child but also the, uh, the steakhouse and um, it's it's very unusual to be driving through South Oxford and looking in the field and seeing all these black animals so again the interesting comparison here will be not just the beef but also the fact that it's actually not in its normal habitat which is normally in Scotland or the US or Argentina or Ireland so it's, uh, it's unusual to have uh, Black Angus so close to the restaurant. A few words about that particular farm, uh, they have a herd of 120 and two bulls and they produce 35 to 40 animals which are exclusively used by the Sophie's restaurants and Jeremy's own uh, hotels and restaurants that are located near Oxford. So you've got a very wide range of um, uh, breeds uh, from different terroirs. And we really look forward to your um, feedback tonight. And I'd like to introduce you to Fred Smith now, who's a chef with a great background in beef. Um, he's worked in some uh, great restaurants like the Vendum, uh, Ransom's Docks, who have been 
pioneers, as well as the Admiral Codrington recently. They were doing fantastic, fantastic meat. Um, and he, he can talk about beef from a chef's perspective in terms of selection, breeds, and cooking. Going forward, at any time tonight, we're going to be around. If you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. If you can't get the question to me today, I'll give you my email address and Fred's email address. And uh, Dara, who unfortunately can't be with us today because he has a death of his family, the three of us will be glad to talk to you on the phone or answer any questions as, uh, any, for as, long, as long as it takes to, uh, to deal with everyone's requests. So thank you very much for coming and for your attention. I'd like to introduce you to Fred Smith now. Good evening, everyone. Um, I must say I feel quite privileged to be talking to you all this evening. Um, my sort of journey with beef really started quite, at quite a young age where I mean I just always was my favourite meal when my father used to cook it for me on a Friday evening. Uh, when I became a chef, um, every restaurant I always worked in took a huge amount of pride in sourcing the beef, whether that would be from farms, from particular standards of husbandry or um, particular breeds particular regions, as Dino has touched on a little bit. Um, over the last few years, my obsession has become more and more intense, and I've kind of been scouring the UK, you know, visiting multiple abattoirs and farms and different people who are doing, you know, approaching the industry in very different ways, you know, and I've learned an enormous amount about it. Um, and I think that there are, there are certainly some very key aspects that, you know, come in terms of the production of the beef that Dino spoke a little bit about. Um, but what I suppose I always looked for in terms of a chef was an element of control. You know, uh, working with, with suppliers, you know, whether it's farmers, whether it's abattoirs, who can give you as much traceability as possible. You know, so that, you know, if there is any sort of problem, you can always go right back to the source and try and find the cause. Um, working with, with Dino and Dara, over the last few years has, has been you know a fantastic insight into their production of beef um, and it was always great value to me to be quite close to them and be able to go go to the site go into the fridges see exactly how they're looking after the meat and then pick the exact pieces of meat that i wanted um, one of the things for me was that i particularly liked I liked aged meat, you know, to a point, something that we could certainly talk about further through the evening, um, as I believe that there's a certain kind of preference point. I think there's a certain amount of age that, you know, that you look for that's desirable. And then when you, you know, you can go further and different cuts age in different ways and it has different effects, but I wanted to have as much of that control as possible. So when going, once the meat sort of goes beyond 21, you know, if we're talking dry aging here as well, it becomes quite difficult, you know, the, the outside of the meat becomes quite dark. So it's difficult to tell the qualities of the inside of the meat. So I found it very useful working with, with suppliers where I could go and I could pick the meat when it was actually maybe only 7 to 14 days, which gave me a far better idea of the, of the grain of the meat, the texture, the marbling, whether there was kind of, you know, you can get different types of marbling. You can have a thick marbling where there's quite thick, low, thick, uh, strands of fat and then very, very fine marbling. I was more interested in the finer marbling, um, which meant that during the cooking process, you would end up with a much more kind of rounded flavor in the mouth rather than kind of streaks here and there that might not render properly. So um, that was particularly, uh, particularly important to me. Um, I mean, I also started to, to buy in larger cuts of meat so I could prepare it, butcher it myself and create cuts you know, that suited my clientele and also allowed me to cut every day. Because I believe you know, a lot of people, a lot of chefs these days will be buying steaks pre-cut and, you know, and, and they don't necessarily know how they're going to sell it. And as soon as a, cut, a steak is cut, you know, immediately it's got more exposure to the air and it, it starts to oxidize and you start to play around with the flavor. So by having the larger cuts that is, I could almost cut to order, again, gave me further, further control. Um, I think that there's, you know, there's, there's, there's quite a few different ways to approach cooking the steak, um, and, and everybody will have their own preference. Uh, certain, you know, certain steakhouses, which, you know, is one approach, will cook over open charcoal. 
um, which I think adds a particular flavour to the meat. I, I'm a big believer in actually cooking. I think if I was at home, and actually sometimes this is a good way to look at it, and I could do whatever I wanted with quite a heavy skillet, and let's say a coat de bœuf, which is what we'll be eating this evening, um, start by rendering the fat, you know? So you don't actually add any oil or any other flavour whatsoever to the pan, and then just let that fat render, which will caramelise as well. Seasoning on both sides, and uh, I prefer just salt. I see pepper as a flavouring rather than a seasoning in terms of beef. Um, and then get, which will give you full contact, and so you can get as much caramelisation and the mild reaction as possible, which I think, for me, enhances just the beefiness of the product. You know, lets it sort of stand out as much for what it is, you know, rather than masking it with other flavours. Um, so I think that, um, you know, there's kind of so much here to talk about, and I'm looking forward to sort of wandering around the crowd tonight and talking to each of you and assessing any questions that you might have. Um, and I think that... Uh, uh, what I'd like to do now is, um, I mentioned right at the beginning, so uh, at the beginning I, I actually talked about wine and beef together, and I think um, I'd like to introduce you to Tom Gilby, who's um, the owner and managing director of uh, the Vintner, a fantastic wine business, and uh, we had a brief chat about um, uh, obviously, I let him know specific um, uh, types of beef we were going to have, and set him the challenge really of um, uh, of bringing some really nice wines to go with it. Which um, you know, it's always it's always difficult because um, we go to restaurants and at home, and it's I think I think it's an interesting exercise. And uh, so, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Tom, who's going to talk about the specific wines you're going to be drinking tonight with a series of uh, uh, beef uh, steaks that you're going to have to test in. So, over to you, Tom. Thank you, Jason. Thanks. Um, ladies and gents, just on those two tables there, can you put your wine glasses in a, in a line, please? So we've got three glasses in front of us. Sorry, I haven't done that table either there. No. Um, as, uh, as Dino said, when, uh, when we were putting together the, uh, the concept for this evening, we didn't really know which cuts of meat we'd be, we'd be enjoying. Um, there's one great variety for, in, or there's a couple, but in my eyes to avoid with, uh, with steak, and that's perhaps Pinot Noir and maybe Gamay. What we've gone, what we've gone for here is, is three very different styles of wines. Uh, we're going to start on the left-hand glass. We're going to have a really traditional and beautifully made Bordeaux from Chateau Sisac, 2008. Very traditional very delicious and really great with uh, the slightly leaner cuts of meat. In the middle glass, uh, and we can get pouring here guys, so in the middle glass we're going to have a, a New Zealand wine made from a blend of Cabernet and Merlot, uh, it's called the Main Divide and it's quite, that's quite an unusual blend to be coming out of New Zealand. Generally we see Pinot Noir and lots of uh, Germanic grape varieties. So Cabernet Merlot, this is made by the winery that makes Pegasus Bay. Uh, it's made in Marlborough. It's a very traditional blend, I, it's a Bordeaux blend. They age the wine for two years in French oak barriques and you'll find it a little bit sweeter, a little bit fleshier and a little bit more intense than the Seasac. Um, and then the really big gun this evening is going to be in the right hand glass. So in the right hand glass we're going to be pouring a Zinfandel from Peter Franus. So he's a, he's a very small grower in Napa, operating in a region called Caneros. He makes approximately six or seven hundred cases of Zinfandel each year. We're going to have the 2008 and it's a very, very powerful wine, extraordinarily intense, utterly delicious and I think will be very, very interesting to taste with, uh, with this meat. So really we're looking at three different intensities in the wine. We've got um, the lightest wine being Chateau Sisac, moving to uh, the, the Cabernet Merlot from Marlborough, and then moving to the Zinfandel from Peter Franis. To be honest, this is as much of an adventure for me as it is for you, so I'm excited to see how these wines go. Um, my colleague here, Charlie, and I will be pouring your wines this evening. Ask us, uh, ask us anything you'd like about the wine. But what I would encourage you to do is taste these wines before you've eaten any food. Before you've eaten any steak at all, taste all three of these wines.
because they will change completely with, uh, once, you, once you begin eating. And they'll continue to change as you eat, uh, as you eat each cut. So really try and, try and remember what's your left, your middle and your right hand glass. Um, if you've forgotten what's going in them, ask us as we go around um, and really enjoy these wines and give us feedback because we're really interested in it as well. So thank you very much indeed. Are we blind tasting? <laughs> Dino, Dino, are we blind tasting or are we revealing the identities? Okay, we are blind tasting, so they're going to come out as a twosome. All right. Okay. All will be revealed. Um, I don't know if that reflects your reactions. Can, uh, does anybody? I mean, we're not saying which is the best, but did you all have sort of kind of like? Varied reactions and, and there were differences, there were marked differences, there were personal preferences. Okay. All right. Sorry? We just want to know what they are. Okay. All right. I will also show you because I'm very disciplined. All right. What was A, do you know? A. Okay, so A was um, the uh, Black Angus from uh, Rufford Farm. Pure Black Angus, which had been matured for 40 days. 40 days matured, okay. All right. Rufford Farm. B. Uh, so B was uh, one of the O'Shea's uh, special reserve, which was uh, a uh, Sussex from uh, Southwest Ireland in Munster. <laughs> And that was matured for 36 days. So no wonder we found it hard to choose between them. I mean, both absolutely, absolutely excellent. So C. Uh, C was the uh, Oakley Farm uh, Australian Wagyu, which uh, which is actually uh, it's actually wet aged, but you know, which is a sort of oxymoron really, but comes in a backpack, but it was 28 days aged. So if anyone uh, noticed a slightly different sort of um, flavour element to that after A and B, it was due to the wet age, A and B were both dry aged, weren't they? Yeah. Okay. And uh, the great, the, the, for those of you who are interested in Wagyu, um, it, was a, it was a grade 11. So it's 12 is the highest grade, and it was a grade 11. Sorry, we, we Do you know what, sorry, Dino, can you tell us what the grades mean? Sorry, we farm with that. It's Oakley in uh, Australia. New, New South Wales. It's one of the few that gets exported to Japan. Do you know what do the ages mean? What do they refer to? I mean, the, the well, numbers, I, I the, mean, the, um, the grading system grades. really is, um, is, is very, both for USDA, and for Wagyu, it's purely based on marbling. So, the problem with that is that it incentivizes farmers to produce as much marbling as possible, which is not necessarily, if it's naturally produced, it may be good, but if it's forced, it's not. So, in both cases, the USDA that we have and the, um, the Wagyu, it's a pretty natural process. It hasn't been force fed or anything. But, if, uh, but both the Wagyu and the um, USDA has had considerable grain. The USDA has had um, up to 285 days of grain. And is that D? Uh, yeah, sorry, the Wagyu is uh, E. E. Sorry. The what the, was sorry, C? The, the, the USDA was prime. USDA Prime was E, Australian Wagyu was C, and D was, uh, the fourth one, was um, the Black Angus from Perthshire, which was um, 38 days mature. That's really interesting. 
Japanese Wagyu grading. 12 is the maximum, so it's a very, very high quality uh, Wagyu. 11. It was 11. It's 11, yeah. Nearly it's, it's labeled as 9 plus, but it was actually 11. Uh, D, D was uh, O'Shea Special Reserve Black Angus, 38 days. Uh, aged on the boat. Um, so that's, a, that, that, that's the same breed as the first one, but from Perth in Scotland as opposed to Oxford. The last one was uh, uh, EUSDA Prime from uh, Greater Omaha, Nebraska, which is essentially corn fed. So it's, it's so. What I'd say about all of these beefs is that there's two, two experiences you have. One is the initial succulents. So obviously the highest the marbling, the succulents level tends to be higher. And then is the, it's the ongoing longevity of the taste. And so your palate will determine which one you prefer. You know, so. So a note about the wines and um, right level. Um, whoa, I know we're all, we're all still looking forward to the rest of the evening. Um, a note about the wines, I think I, I basically said they're all beautifully balanced. Um, we enjoyed all of the, for some of us the Chateau Cissac was kind of like the creme de la creme. But at this stage, we just, Dino is very happy to take any questions, reactions, um, Anyway, anything you want to throw at He's very happy to re respond to email questions, but is there anything anybody wants to raise right now? So before, um, before you do so, question, because price, how much? Price, okay, very relevant. What is the relevant, what is the price of each of these? Do you so, know, do you? So, um, so Shades is probably the most expensive. <laughs> <laughs> So yours is the most expensive. Uh, right. You have carried it here in your own voice. <laughs> it's just as well we enjoyed it so much. According to Dino, Jared, is that the joke? I don't know. No, no. no sorry, before, before I uh, go any further, if anybody wants to send me an email, very easy to remember, it's Dino, think of the Flintstones, at O'SheaButchers.com. Okay, so you can send me an email. And Fred, what's your email address? Fred. Fred what? Paris, Paris. 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 Yeah, Paris, as in Paris, France, Smith at gmail.com. Okay. We'll put it all in the newsletter, won't we? Um, Richard, we'll... And before, before I talk about the meat again, I just want to say again, Tom Gilby, the wine selection was really fantastic. And I think... wine this Christmas. Please don't buy wine from anywhere else but the <laughs> Okay, are there any questions? 
questions at this stage. I'm not sure we've answered the price one, but... Um... Oh, sorry, no, I'll answer the price one. I'll answer the price, price. one. Price. Yeah. In terms of retail, um, they're pretty much all the same on a per kilo basis. Marginal difference, 50p here and there. But the most um, expensive one, the one that stands out, is the Australian Wagyu, which is uh, C, which is maybe five times the price of anything else you've had to get. So if it was five times better, then you'd be happy to pay that. What sort of price is that? Um, Australian Wagyu is um, about 285 pounds a kilo. So, okay, so if you like to see, start saving 285 pounds a kilo. Change of taste.